number three song leader for the day, sir. <laughs> anyway, let's all grab a hymn book and stand, and we'll turn to page 449, 449. Dwelling in Beulah Land, we'll sing all four verses. 449. Far away the noise of strife upon my ear is falling. Then I know the sins of earth be set on every hand. Out in fear and things of earth in vain to me are calling. None of these shall move me from Beulah land. I'm living on the mountain underneath the cloudless sky. I'm drinking at the fountain that never shall run dry. Oh yes, I'm feasting on the manna from a bountiful supply for I am dwelling in Beulah land. Far below the storm of doubt upon the world is beating. Sons of men in battle long in daily fee we stand. Safe am I within the castle Nothing then can reach me, tis Beulah land. I'm living on the mountain underneath the cloudless sky. I'm drinking at the fountain that never shall run dry. Oh yes, I'm feasting on the manna from a bountiful supply. For I am dwelling in Beulah land. Let the storm of breeze remove their can. I can't get the words going. I, and I'm safely down. Help me out here. Here and then the sun is on. I can't get it. You sing. Da, 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 da. I'm living on the mountain that sleeps a cloudless sky. I'm drinking at the fountain that never shall run dry. Oh, yes, I'm feasting on the mountain. contemplation hearing now his blessed voice i see the way he planned dwelling in the spirit here i learn a full salvation gladly will i tarry in Beulah land i'm living on the mountain underneath the cloudless sky i'm drinking at the fountain that never shall run dry oh yes i'm feasting on the man from a bountiful supply, for I am dwelling in Beulah land. All right, I think I should have looked over it. I don't think I've ever sang that third verse. <laughs> Just like Brother Harris said this morning on that five-verse song, that he had been in church 40 years and never done all five, I don't think I've ever done the third verse, ever. It was first, second, and last, so my bad. And then apparently we used to do it way faster when I was a song leader. So sorry about that, Miss Tiffany. Oh, it took off. <laughs> so, but anyway, we're, we're getting it done and uh, dwelling in Beulah Land. I'm looking forward to it. And a uh, great service this morning. And uh, had some returning visitors. And so that was exciting. And uh, all of us regular folks were here. And then we do have several that are sick. So let's remember them and pray for them that the Lord heals them up soon. So let's have a word of prayer and we'll continue with the service. Lord Jesus, thank you for this day and thank you for a great morning you gave us. Thank you for meeting with us. And Lord, thank you, Lord, for heaven and what we talked about this morning. And thank you for uh, your word, Lord, and revealing to us all the things that are about heaven. And God, Lord, I ask you to help us to, Lord, look forward to it, but uh, help us to do what we're supposed to do while we're down here. And Lord, I ask you to be with all the ones that are sick, touch their bodies, give them strength, give them healing. Lord, be with the service tonight. Come down and meet with us in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. All right. Go through our announcements real quick. <clears throat> uh, of course, our uh, April, we got our 13th and the 27th is our churchwide soul winning. Uh, the 16th, uh, the ladies' Bible study, of course, which is next Tuesday. And then 26th through the 27th is ladies' meeting in Evansville, Indiana. Hope you got all your information this morning. If you haven't, see Miss uh, Sharon for that. And then May, we got on the 4th, we got our church picnic. And the 12th is Mother's Day. And then the 11th and 25th is the churchwide soul winning in May. And again, anniversary, uh, Chris and Megan. 
on April 7th, and then Brother Terry Harris' birthday on April 10th. I think that's it. Okay. All right, we'll stand again, and we'll try it this time. Uh, like I said, Brother Harris, he said that he'd already celebrated his birthday uh, for this month, and uh, but his son Tyler, that was uh, those of you that helped me move, uh, that was his youngest son. His birthday is on the tenth as well, and then Tyler's son, oldest son Phoenix, is on the tenth. So, dad, son, and grandson, all three same birthday. So, uh, I told him they ought to, you know, write the news or call the news and get that story up. That's pretty cool, all three of them. But anyway, higher ground, page three twenty-seven, three twenty-seven. I'm pressing on the upward way. I'll try that third verse too. Again. Here we go. I'm pressing on the upward way. New heights I'm gaining every day. Still praying as I'm onward bound. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand. My faith on heaven's table land. A higher plane that I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. on higher ground I want to live above the world though Satan's darts at me are hurled for faith has caught the joyful sound the song of saints on higher ground Lord lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table land a higher plane that I have found Lord plant my feet on higher I want to scale the utmost height and catch a gleam of glory bright. But still I'll pray till heaven I found. Lord, lead me on to higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand. My faith on heaven's table land, a higher plane that I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. You can be seated. Thank you. be turning to Judges chapter 8. Judges chapter 8. And I announced this morning that next Sunday we have the scary missionaries coming. And uh, I'm sure he's heard that a lot. And uh, they are scary. But anyway, Brother Taryn's scary. Uh, he was uh, in the Bible college where my wife and I taught. And a uh, sharp young man. And uh, they're going to the mission field. And so they had stopped by sometime at the end of the year last year or the beginning of this year. And we scheduled uh, to this coming Sunday the 14th for them to be with us so he could present. And uh, his family does sing as well. So they'll be singing for us on that next Sunday morning and then uh, presenting next Sunday morning. And then Sunday night, they'll sing for us again and I'm going to have him preach. So he'll be here for that. Uh, but Judges chapter 8. And uh, I'm going to have to just hit the ground running on this one. And again, this that. I felt like that this morning. I went a little longer than I normally do this morning trying to get all that in about heaven and left out a lot. But uh, that was exciting to me to talk about heaven. And uh, this is just as exciting. And uh, we'll get a little chapter content here. I'm going to tell you a whole lot of content. And then I'm just going to take out one phrase out of all the content. And that's what we're going to preach about. But if we're looking at um, Ch Judges chapter 8, of course, this is Gideon. And if you looked in verse 5... Uh, we'll see here that Gideon was pursuing uh, Zeba and Zalmanah, uh, the kings of Midian. These were two different kings, and Gideon was after them. He was on their trail. He was on the hunt for these two kings. And, of course, obviously, we know Gideon was of the Lord, and these two kings were against the Lord. And so, yes, there was battles, just like they're going on in our world today. Uh, you can't get away from them. I wish they weren't happening, but the Bible just says that's going to happen. And uh, uh, you can trace most of it back to those for the Lord and those for, against the Lord and so forth. Uh, but this is a situation. So Gideon and his men 
were after these fellows. In verse 4, it said, Gideon and his 300 men were pursuing and they become faint. And so I alluded to that fact this morning that he had a, a lot more men than 300. And uh, the Lord said, that's too many. And he's like, excuse me? <laughs> uh, you know, we're going after these guys and they got lots of soldiers. And he told them, you know, you have them drink out of the brook and the, way, the ones that drink like this, send them home. The ones that drink like this, keep them. And, of course, he got it down to 300 men. So these 300 men and Gideon, in verse 4, were pursuing these two kings. And in verse 5, uh, it said that they came to the, uh, the princes of, of Succoth. And, uh, and it says here, you know, basically I'm paraphrasing here, we're hungry. <laughs> give us some bread. Uh, if you've got some loaves, give us some loaves because we're pursuing these kings and we're getting a little thin in the skin. <laughs> uh, we're getting hangry. Uh, we, we need some food. And so they, they said in verse 6, the prince of Succoth said, uh, you know, that, uh, you know, it says here, you had them in your hands uh, and we would give you bread. In other words, if you'd conquered these kings and helped us out a little bit, we'd give you some bread. But since you don't have them yet, no, <laughs> we're not going to give you bread. And so, again, uh, when somebody's hungry <laughs> or hangry, like I get, uh, you, know, it, you know, we get in the flesh a little bit quicker. Uh, you know, maybe we don't respond as nice as we should, or maybe we say something that we shouldn't have said. So in verse 7, it says here, Gideon told them, okay, that's fine. <laughs> you don't have to give us bread, but when we come back, we're going to tear your flesh with thorns and briars. And uh, so it, it upset Gideon a little bit. Uh, you know, I, I see the bread right there. Y'all got plenty, and y'all could give us some bread and help us out here and give us some strength, and we'll go back after them. But since you're not going to give us the bread, you know, God's going to deliver these fellows to us. And so when we get back, we're, gonna, we're coming after you all with some thorns and some briars. And uh, you know, we're going to give you all good switching. And in verse 8, it says here that they came to another guy, Peniel. And it uh, says here, and they asked for bread, and he spake likewise. Saying, nope, if you had these kings in, 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 uh, you know, in, in captivity, you captured them, I'd give you some bread. But since you don't, we don't have time for y'all to eat. Y'all need to get after them. And so he, again, maybe still in the flesh a little bit. And Gideon told him, all right, that's fine. But when I come, this, this tower you're working on, I'm breaking it down. Uh, so, uh, again, again, I don't know. God put this story in the Bible. And so I don't, I don't think he's approving uh, us in the flesh uh, and us getting upset. Uh, but Gideon took it to heart. He said, look, you know, I'm trying to help everybody and ca capture these guys. We're hungry. And since you won't give us bread, we're going to switch you when we get back. Briars and thorns to your flesh. And when we get back, Peniel, we're going to tear that tower down that you're working on. And so verse 12 says here, Gideon caught uh, the two kings. And uh, then verse 13 it says, and when he returned from battle before the sun up. In other words, this stuck in his crawl. Uh, you know, he, he remembered. You know, I, I caught these guys and God helped us and got, got these things. But I remember those rascals that wouldn't give us any, you know, McDonald's french fries. And uh, they wouldn't give us any, you know, Happy Meals or anything, you know, so I'm not stopping. Since we've got these, let's go. And it says here, they returned before, from battle before the sun up. And uh, again, some of us have, uh, I remember when our kids were a certain age, we liked traveling at night. Okay, because it was quieter. Uh, they wouldn't argue as much. And uh, they would sleep. And, uh, you know, she, used, she usually would join them. <laughs> And I'd get my sunflower seeds, and my back then it was real Dr. Pepper, a real Mountain Dew. Now it's the diet time. But anyway, uh, I would just drive, but it was a blessing. But we see here that he stayed up all night. He got back. He traveled through the night. Verse 14, it says here, and Gideon caught up with these men of Succoth. In verse 15, it says, and Gideon said, look, uh, you know, here they are. They're in my hands. And you remember, <laughs> you wouldn't give us bread when we were weary. Verse 16, it says here, And Gideon took out the thorns and the briars, and he went at them. <laughs> it says here, and he taught the men. He said, buddy, uh, if I ever ask you for some bread again and you don't give it to me, you remember this. Verse 17, Gideon beat down the tower, and he slew the men of the city. So, in all of those verse 17, first 17 verses, the moral of the story or the context of the story of Gideon ever ask you for bread, give it to him. All right? And uh, so that's where we are right now, first 17 verses. Uh, again, God puts stuff in there, and, you know, I can see some principles there. If somebody's trying to do the right thing and they need, help them. 
Uh, especially if it, the Bible says if it's in the power of your hands to do it. If somebody asks you for something, give it to them. Uh, now, again, maybe uh, he got in the flesh a little bit. Maybe he you know, shouldn't have reacted like that, but he did. Uh, and so then now, verse 18 is where we're going to preach from. I just wanted to catch you up uh, from the story. And so in verse 18, it says, Then said, after all that, after give me some bread, nope. Okay, I'll remember that. I'm going to go get these kings coming back, whipping you with some briars, tearing your tower down. After all that's done, then verse 18, it says, Then said unto uh, Zeba and uh, Zalman, it says here, What manner of men were they whom ye slew in Tabar? And so this is why they were after them. Uh, they needed to be taken out. Uh, why? Because they had kind of like Paul. Uh, before Paul became a Christian, Paul persecuted Christians. Paul uh, persecuted churches. These guys had been taken out Christians. And uh, I don't guess they were called Christians back then. People that trusted in the Lord. And it says here, and they answered, as thou art. Talking to Gideon. Just like you. I can look at you and tell that the people that we took out were just like you. Maybe cut from the same cloth, they say. Uh, or acted just like you. Or sounded just like you. Uh, and it says here, that, as thou art, so were they. And it says here, each one resembled the children of the king. And so this is why they got taken out. Because they looked like a child of the king. And so my question to all of us tonight, do you resemble the king? Uh, and, and I've heard it said this way, if you were on trial tonight for being a Christian... Would there be enough evidence to convict? That's what he's saying here. We just went out and we took out all the Christians. All the ones that looked like God's children. All the ones that were a child of the king. And so anybody that resembled the child of the king, they were taken out. So let's have a word of prayer and we'll, we'll preach a sermon called, Do You Resemble the King? Lord Jesus, thank you for this day. Uh, thank you for the opportunity we have to serve you. And Lord, I just ask you to, uh, Lord, help us realize, Lord, you put stories like this in the Bible. Uh, so that we can learn some principles. Uh, obviously, we see that maybe these men should have shared their bread, uh, and, and, and some of these things wouldn't have happened. Maybe the retaliation would not, was not what you would have, but if they'd have done what they were supposed to, it wouldn't have took, taken place. But obviously, we see in this story that uh, these people were killed because they resembled the king. And Lord, if we resemble the king, we're going to face flack at work. We're going to face flack in the world. Uh, we're going to face flack maybe even in our own families. Uh, Lord, but help us to realize, Lord, it's more important to resemble the child of the king than any of these other things. In Jesus' name, amen. So we see in verse 19, it says here, Gideon told them <coughs> that they were his brethren. And if they would have not killed them, uh, they, would, they wouldn't return the favor and kill them. In verse 20, it says here, Gideon told his sons, uh, Jether, go slay them. And so, of course, uh, you know, he was but a youth, the Bible says there in verse 20, and he drew not his sword. And so then, uh, verse 21, Gideon went ahead and did it himself. So, uh, we see the, 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 the topic here tonight is, do we just resemble the king? So, by the way of introduction, uh, we're going to look here uh, and see. Each one of us should resemble a child of the king. Each one of us should resemble a Christian. And, and look, act, sound, all this kind of stuff we're going to look at and see what the Bible says. But each one of us are to re resemble the child of the king. The Bible says in Revelation 19, 16 that Jesus is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And so there is no higher king and there is no higher Lord than Jesus Christ. And so I'm laying the foundation here that he is the king of kings. And so if we're saved, we're God's child. We are a child of the king and we should resemble the king. Uh, the Bible says in John 1, 12, but as many as received him, to them gave him the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. And so, of course, a child most likely resembles the king. And I could, I could call some examples up here tonight. Uh, when I look at some of the dads and then I look right beside them or look right down the row from them, it's very obvious whose child that is. Same way with the daughters uh, and the moms. Uh, and then sometimes you've got the opposite. Uh, we have two boys, but one of them looks just like my wife. <laughs> And uh, even though he's a dude, uh, and then we have one that looks just like me, and both guys. And so, anyway, but you can see family resemblances sitting right here in front of me. 
And uh, pictures on your wall at home, you can see the family resemblances. And that's what he's saying here, that God gave us the power to become the sons of God, the children of God, and we ought to resemble our Heavenly Father. So, I'm a child of the King, and uh, I sing that song, and uh, I'm excited about it when I sing it. That I'm a child of the King, I'm proud of it, and I hope I resemble Him. I hope that when people see me, they see Him through me. Uh, and again, we ought to take pride in that. And that's exactly what took place here, uh, that these guys were killing anybody that resembled a child of the king. So, as by way of introduction, it says here, do we resemble the child of the king? Uh, and of course, I've already used that analogy about the uh, Christian. If you were on trial for being a Christian, would you have enough to, to convict yourself? And the word resemble here means to be like or to be similar, similar to. Uh, there ought to be some similarities uh, if you are related, if you are a child of the king. Uh, Strong's Concordance, if you look up uh, this word resemble uh, in the book of Judges, uh, in the Hebrew translation, it basically said according to form. In other words, it was, you know, of course, if you had a mold, uh, and you were putting something, maybe ceramic or maybe jello <laughs> or, or whatever kind of mold that you could have. I guess they have metal out there, uh, mold. Uh, when you put that mold down, you expect it to look just like what's on the underside of that mold. And if, you know, if you're going down there stamping things out, and all of a sudden one doesn't look like it, it sticks out. Oh, that one's messed up. <laughs> that one doesn't look like it was created. And so, uh, let's move it. So we ought to resemble. So we see here having a trans, uh, the translation according to form. Now the Bible does talk about that, that you can have a form of godliness... But you can deny the power thereof. So I say, in my translation here, have the form of godliness and the power thereof. Uh, it's not saying, okay, you can have all the power you want, but don't, just forget about the form. No, we're supposed to have the form. Uh, we're supposed to resemble the king. And so there's a lot of people out there today, they work on the form. Uh, they get the KJV under the arm. Uh, they get the Baptist sidewalls. Uh, they get the you know they get all the Baptist garb on and things like that and they've got the form and they even say amen and they go to where they're supposed to be but if they're not saved they've just worked on the form but they're not really related but so it's not saying here you know just have the power and don't worry about the form no we need both we need to have the form and the power so second point under the introduction we do we bear family resemblances. Do we bear family resemblances? And so there's probably in this room right here some family resemblances. And uh, the, I guess the biggest one that pops to my mind, and I don't need to word, use the word biggest because you'll get offended. But uh, my daughter-in-law, uh, I guess her mom's maiden name was Hackenberg. Is that what it is? Hackenberg? Hackenberger. Oh, burger like you. Hackenberger. All right. So the Hackenbergers have a very, very distinct nose all right and i won't say it's big okay uh, but it does have a unique shape uh and, and so forth and so uh, as the kids grew, go through there and there were several twins in that side of the family things like that but they all came out with the same nose up oh, hackenberger nose hackenberger nose all right very similar and next time you see jessica go up there and look at her and say Hackenberger knows, all right? Uh, you know, she's like, ah. Uh, but anyway, it's just, that's just a thing. And maybe you have that in your family. My, my family, uh, on my dad, I guess one uncle didn't. He got his hair from his mom. But my, my grandfather, my dad, and my uncle Tony, and my dad and myself, we all have the Stanley hairline, all right, receding, all right, and, uh, and so forth. Uh, so it just happens. It's a family resemblance. Uh, then, so you have noses. Then there's some of you, you have certain types of ears. All right, your lobe is connected, or it's actually a lobe. Uh, you know, everybody's going to be looking at everybody's lobes now. Uh, but anyway, and then some, you know, some people, they like to doctor them up, make them bigger and hang and all that kind of stuff. But anyway, I don't know that that's a thing that we ought to do. Uh, but anyway, uh, so, you know, ear lobes. Sometimes, some people have little ears. Somebody have, hey, Mickey Mouse. Uh, well, they got big ears, okay? And, uh, you know, they get Dumbo or whatever. Family resemblance. You're like, oh, I wish I didn't have these ears. Some people have big heads. Uh, if Brother Harris was here, I'd make fun of him. You know, because all his family, they got humongous heads and, and so forth. 
But uh, some people have little heads. Some people in some families are all tall. I mean, even the ladies. You have to look up to them and say, sir. Uh, I'm just kidding. Uh, they're just tall. Uh, then some people have a short family. It's just a family resemblance. Uh, we have uh, different skin tones. We have definitely different hair colors. Uh, we had a family in the church where we used to work uh, that mom and dad had red hair. They had four boys that had red hair. And then now I think they got 75 grandkids. <laughs> I mean, a lot. Uh, and they all have red hair. I mean, they had this one family picture, and I mean, I don't know how they got them all in there. All right? But it's just red hair everywhere. Amen? And, uh, and so, family resemblance. So we see here that when we bear a resemblance of the king, uh, we ought to have some similarities. So we'll look at the Bible now that I've just rambled on, on on other things that we can look at. But we ought to look like God. Okay? We ought to look like God. Well, I've never seen him. And uh, again, in, in some of the pictures that we've seen, I guess, that, uh, that they've made of Jesus, I'm not thinking he's blonde-headed. I don't think Jesus would have blue eyes. All right? He was Jewish. Okay? He was going to be dark-complected, darker eyes, dark skin. But anyway, so that's just that's a made-up picture. Okay? And again, I'm not wearing sandals and no flowy robe. Okay? Uh, I get it. <laughs> uh, and, and so forth. I'm not saying that. Uh, you know, uh, whew. And is, well, they call them mandals. I don't think man and sandals go together. So you can say mandals all you want. That's like mandation and uh, manny hose and all that stuff. No, <laughs> uh, you can add man to it all you want. It's not going to work in this book, okay? Uh, so we see here, but we ought to look like God. Why? With Genesis 126, it says, And God said, Let us, talking Jesus and God, let us make man in our own image. So God made us to look like him in his image. Genesis 5.1. This is the book of the generations of Adam. And in that day God created man in his likeness of God made he him. And so again I know there are uh, brunettes and blonde heads and brown heads and black heads and things like that. God made it different. But we're all in his image. Uh, and it says here because of sin uh, we're going to have that struggle. Okay? And it's going to be a constant fight. Why? Because the devil in the world is going to say, you need to look like this. And there's a dude out there. Uh, I, I, don't, I, can't, I think he's got two first names, kind of like our missionary. Uh, but he's a, they call him a drag queen. Okay? I'm not doing that. <laughs> I'm just not. Okay, uh, and you know, there's, there's all kinds of stuff out there. So this world may say, oh, that's the, that's the way to go. Uh, mm -mm. Uh, I'm going to look like God and so forth. Uh, but anyway, we see uh, because of this, we're going to have to fight. And the Bible says in Psalm 17, 15, as for me. So we're going to have to make a decision just like these people. The reason they got killed that day is because they resembled the king. And so we're going to get attacked. We're going to get berated. We're going to get maybe even made fun of. Why? If we make a choice to be like God. And Psalm 17, 15 says this, as for me. I will behold thy face. In other words, we can't look at God face to face until we get to heaven. So we have to look at him in here. And so, okay, this is, I believe it even, there's a couple of verses that say this is the mirror. All right? And we're supposed to look at it. And, uh, and so we see that it says here, I'm, I, I behold thy face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake in thy likeness. So a Christian has to be determined. Uh, there's kids out there today, they're determined to look just like, and you can just put in the name. Uh, back in the day when Michael Jordan was the, uh, the, the premier basketball player, everybody wanted Jordans to the point they would shoot people to steal their shoes. Why? Because they wanted to look like Jordan. Anything I can do. Uh, when he shaved his head, lots of people started shaving their head. Uh, you know, again, if you have a weird shaped head, that doesn't work good. All right. Uh, but then some people, when I played basketball, some people would wear that black knee brace with the red folded down and their knee was fine. What were they doing? They were trying to be like Mike. They even wrote a song. OK. And then again, you can take that and go any movie star you want to think of, any uh, athlete you want to think of. And they're 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 so focused that I won't be satisfied until I awake in that person's likeness. 
But the Bible says in Psalm 15, 17, we, we won't be satisfied until we wake in God's likeness. So it is important what we look like and how we sound and how we portray ourselves. Uh, the next thing it says here, it is important that we please or who we please. Uh, Matthew 6, 31. Therefore, take no thought. This is what the Bible says. Therefore, take no thought. So if Paris Hilton's wearing it, don't take thought about that. Oh, I've got to have one of those because Paris does. All right? She's just a rich, <laughs> spoiled little... Anyway, but anyway, we, uh, you know, we can't take no thought. Well, Michael Jordan wears a brace on his knee. I've got to have me one. Uh, well, you know, this superstar does this. Take no thought, saying, what shall I eat? Again, they can go on there, and the, the diet pills are the craziest thing right now. And I think it's AI getting involved in things like that, because uh, even the shark people are supposedly selling that stuff. And they say, I've never taken it. Uh, but anyway, uh, whatever so-and-so says, but the Bible says, take no thought, saying, what shall they eat, or what shall they drink, or wherewithal shall they be clothed? So how we look like, the world ha shouldn't have any effect on it. Any movie star shouldn't have any effect on it. Any sports star shouldn't have any effect on it. Why? Because we're supposed to resemble the king. So don't try to please the world. Uh, again, back when I was a teenager, uh, you know, uh, the earrings came out on the dudes. Uh, and I guess it was a certain ear you were supposed to wear. Uh, if you wore it in one ear, you were okay, straight. And if you wore it in the other ear, you are a little you know, sugar in the britches and uh, things like that. And I was like, I'm just not going to. <laughs> Uh, and so take no thought. I don't care what the world says. Uh, again, when, when fads come around and you have to have this and you have to have that, take no thought, the Bible says. Uh, well, all my friends are wearing it or all my friends do it. All my friends say it. Take no thought. Uh, uh, it says here, we ought not to try to please the world the way we look and sound and talk and act and behave. Uh, here's another one. Uh, you know, again, if my wife came in, I don't have to worry about this one iota. I saw this on Pinterest, and this guy is so cute. Nope, <laughs> not going to do it. Uh, I'm going to look like a dude. I'm going to look like a, you know, <laughs> you know, if it don't have Georgia Bulldogs on it, I'm probably not going to wear it, all right? Uh, I'm just, I don't care how cute you think I would look. Uh, I'm not even trying to please my wife. But... Again, if she's right with God and I'm right with God and we're both pleasing God, we'll be pleased with each other. But there's a, I've seen a lot of people, you know, my wife wanted me to get a little tat right here. Or my wife wanted to get me a little piercing right here. Or my, you know, don't. Okay, you're supposed to resemble the king. And so it says here, please God in your appearance. Take no thought. Uh, and then uh, see the third thing in the introduction. It says here, it is important to pay attention to every detail. Every detail. The Bible talks about jot and tittles. Uh, every, every accent mark in this Bible, God says, pay attention to it. Every, every little detail. We talked a little bit this morning about my OCD uh, and how God probably says, do all things decent in order. So he wants us. And so again, when he says, all right, I want you to resemble <clears throat> the king. All right. Uh, one verse. I, I won't take time to read it, but there's one verse that says, if a man have long hair, it's a shame unto him. That's a detail. Uh, so again, and again, a lot of arguments these days, well, Jesus had long hair. Again, those are made up pictures. I don't think the Bible would say it's a shame for a man to have long hair and then Jesus would go around with long hair. So it's important to do the details. And so again, we ought to represent Christ. Uh, in here, there's people that work for, I know Brother Lonnie works for a, a, a heat and air place. And do y'all have shirts that you have to wear? Uniform. All right, and I could go around the room. Ford people probably have to wear stuff that says Ford on it. What? You're representing your company. And so if they came in and said, okay, we're going to kill all the Ford employees or we're going to kill all the AC employees, and oops, sorry about that. You'd cover up that thing. Okay. Uh, you know, I don't know anything about it. You'd hide it. So, same thing here. Uh, military people, they, they look just like a military post, and there's inspections. A tent hut! <laughs> And those guys come around and look, see if their shoes are polished, and see if their belt buckles are shiny, and uh, all the things, and their stripes are in the right place. Uh, wow, they resemble a military person. And so we're supposed to resemble a child of God. And so uh, stay away from trends, and you know, don't try to please things like that. So do we resemble the child of God in our appearance? Number two, do we resemble the king in our temperament? In our temperament. So again, I've seen people dot every independent Baptist eye, 
across every independent Baptist tee uh, in their attire, in their, in their lingo, things like that, but they have a horrible temperament. They're just mad at it. <laughs> like, you know, I'm, I'm right with God, and I'm happy about it. Uh, I, you know, I'm trying to please God, and this... Rah, rah. Uh, <laughs> again, you're worried about the, all the, you know, the dots in the eyes and things like that. Just worry about your relationship with God. And, uh, you know, I've heard people say this, are you saved? Well, yes. Okay, well, tell your face that you're saved, that you're a child of God. You know, you look like you've been sucking on lemons, uh, and you're on your way to heaven. Uh, and, you know, you're biting everybody's head. No, temperament's important. Uh, we see that it says here, it's important how you think. The Bible says, let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. So if we have the mind of Christ, this is where our temperament's developed. How are we going to respond to that? What are we going to say about that? Uh, our temperament uh, is important. Are we resembling the king in his temperament? Job 31.1 says this, I made a covenant with my eyes. Why should I think upon a maid? So the temperament, uh, he had made a covenant with his eyes and said, I'm not going to even think on a maid. Why? Because I want to represent the king. Uh, I want to be a child of the king. Uh, Matthew 4.9 says this, and Jesus knowing their thoughts. Uh, it's important how we think. It will help our temperament. Romans 12, 3 says here, uh, not to think of himself more highly than he ought. So it's important how we think. Do we resemble the king in how we think? 2 Corinthians 3, 5. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything. I'm just telling you how the Bible says to think. Our temperament. How we're, our outlook on life. Not that we, should, that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything. As of ourselves, but our sufficiency is in God. You can see it on the person's temperament where they think, you can't tell me anything. I know it all anyway. Don't tell me what to do. Don't tell me how to think. Don't tell me how to act. And you can see it on their facial expression. Uh, you know, obviously in our world today, authority just gets slammed. The ref's fault. The cop's fault. Uh, and everybody just got that stern temperament about them. Nobody tell me what, Why? Because they're not thinking like this. Are we representing the king? Uh, we ought to think a certain way. And the Bible says here, Galatians 6, 3. For if a man think of himself that to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. Philippians 3, 4. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are a good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. So our temperament... Uh, should also represent the king. So our look should represent the king. Our temperament should represent the king. Uh, parents, kids, uh, they, they, will, they will think how you think. Most of the time, whatever a parent likes, that's what the kid likes. Uh, whatever the parent don't like, that's what the kid don't like. Whatever the parent's scared of, that's what the, parent, the kids are going to be scared of. Uh, it just happens. Uh, and so it's important how we think. It's important how we respond Words that we say over and over, hopefully they're not curse words in this room, <laughs> All right, but there are some words that we say over and over. Uh, and then you know, there's those Christian curse words out there, uh, and again, I won't give you a list of them, you know, shoot, dang, uh, <laughs> heck, uh, all those things. And uh, you know, basically what we're doing, we're just kind of tempering the, the real words uh, and, and so forth, but it's important how you respond. Um, I think I've told this story in here, but we had my, my little niece... And what was she, three years old? Hey, Taylor? She's about three years old. She comes in, and my dad asks her something. He says, hey, Taylor, do you want? And she goes, shoot, yeah. And they're like, what? And she said, what'd you say? I said, shoot, yeah. I, I want that. And uh, you don't say that. We're not supposed to say that. And uh, where'd you hear that? Uh -huh. And so her dad walks in the room, you know, and he gets asked a question. You know what he says. Shoot, yeah. All right. Uh, and so that's what they do. They pick it up. Uh, why? Because they will resemble their parent in what they say, the way they think. Again, that's why we need to be like God in our look and even our, our responding. And so uh, our emotional uh, movements, you know, there's some people that they have emotional movements. You go, what is even that? Anybody ever done that to you? Your kid? Young lady, you go in there. Hand on the hip. And where has she seen that? And you ask the mom something? <laughs> so we got to be careful. They're going to resemble us. 
Uh, you know, some of us, you know, we punch things. You know, wham! Uh, you know, it's, it's okay to punch a sheetrock wall as long as you don't hit the stud. <laughs> then you're going to break your hand. Uh, you know, if we hit things, what is our kids going to do? They're going to hit things. If we, uh, man, clap our hands together, what are they going to do? They're going to be in the nursery doing what we do. They're going to resemble us. Uh, tapping that foot. When are we going to go? You know, and again, I know that these things aren't wicked, but what I'm saying is that our kids are going to resemble us. So we are supposed to resemble the king. Act like Jesus would. Hand on the hip. I don't think Jesus would look like that. And so, uh, so we should resemble the child of the king in our appearance. We should resemble the child of the king in our temperament. Number three, we should re resemble the child of the king in our countenance. Uh, again, we, we talked about that facial expression. Genesis 4 or 5 says this. But unto Cain and to his offering, he had no respect. And Cain was wroth, and his countenance fell. So again, you can, you can see you know, on the face. Some, some kids are very mischievous, and you can see it. They're fixing to do something out of this world. Sometimes their eyes are beady. All right? Sometimes they get a little bit of a smirk and a grin on their face. <laughs> oh, no, they're fixing to do something. That countenance will tell you all about it. They're up to, you know, what did you do? Nothing. You know, eyes about this big, deer caught in the headlights, and they're like, nothing. All right, that countenance. So same thing here. Obviously, Cain brought his offering to the Lord, and the Lord rejected it because it wasn't what God said to do. All right, you're supposed to bring a blood sacrifice, not that. Uh, and, you know, so Cain was wroth, and his countenance fell. And it says here, the look on our face is important. Isaiah, I'm sorry, 1 Samuel 16, 12 says this, and he sent and brought him now a, and he was ruddy and with all of his beautiful countenance, a goodly to look at or look to. And the Lord said, arise, anoint him for this is he. And of course we know that was David and he lined up all the brothers. No, 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 no. Is this all the kids? Well, there's one little whippersnapper over there watching the sheep. We'll bring him in here. And it says here, he got here and ruddy, but he had a beautiful countenance. Uh, there wasn't anything deceptive going on in his face. There wasn't anything worldly going on in his face. He was pure. You could tell he, he loved God. And you can, you can pick people out that way. A lot of them now are, can get to where they can deceive you. Uh, but God knows. And so it is important about our countenance. Uh, and I've heard it said all the time, you know, again, that you know, if you're saved, tell your face. Our countenance uh, should uh, be... Uh, looking or resembling the king. Psalm 10, 4 says this, the wicked, though of, I'm sorry, the wicked, though the pride of his countenance will not seek after God, God is not in all his thoughts. And so again, you look out at the world today that, that they're not saved, they didn't go to church today, they could care less what God says, guarantee you, if you look right here, it's all over it. Hey, but if you did go to church today and you did have that secret place relationship and were close to God like we heard in Sunday school this morning, it ought to show right here. Hey, our countenance, we should resemble the king. Uh, WWJD, what would Jesus do? What would he look like? How would he respond? What would he say? Uh, we ought to or resemble the king. Uh, Psalm 42, 11, Why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou dis disquieting within me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him, who is the health of my countenance and my God. So our countenance is important. Proverbs 15, 13, A merry heart maketh a cheerful countenance, but the sorrow of the heart, the spirit is broken. Proverbs 27, 17, Iron sharpeneth iron, so the sharp... The, uh, I'm sorry, iron sharpeneth iron, so the man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. So it's important what our countenance is. So we see, do we resemble the king in our appearance? Do we resemble the king in our temperament? Do we resemble the king in our countenance? And last one, do we resemble uh, the king in our testimony? In our testimony. 
Uh, obviously, we testified a little bit about Gideon. Uh, he has a testimony. Uh, we, can, we talked about David a little bit. He has a testimony. We talked about Paul. He has a testimony. But we all have a testimony. What others say about us? Do we resemble the king? They will look right. They will respond right. Their countenance is always on top side. They're happy. They're excited about serving God. Uh, and then what they do. Genesis 39.6 says this. Joseph was a goodly person, person and well favored. So that was the testimony of Joseph. Of course, we know Joseph and his coat of many colors and is getting sold into slavery and uh, getting lied about and put in prison. Uh, and then God delivered him to deliver his whole family. He was well favored. Uh, but he was a goodly person. He had that testimony. I, uh, saw, bleh. First Samuel, there we go, 9-2. Saul, a choice young man and a goodly, and there was not among, uh, I'm sorry, and there was not among the children of Israel a goodlier. That's in the Bible. I didn't make up that word. <laughs> All right. So obviously Saul, he had the testimony when he first started. He was head and shoulders above the rest. And this verse said he was a choice young man, a goodly. Uh, and there wasn't a goodlier one. Uh, he, was, he was the right choice. Obviously we know that he let it go to his head. And the Bible says he wist not when the Spirit of God left him. Uh, and God took his hand off of him. And of course uh, he had to battle with David. But at first... He had the right kind of testimony. Proverbs 20, verse 11, Even a child is known by his doings, whether his work be pure or whether it be right. So even a child can have a testimony. So we see here in verse 18, the reason that these, kid, these uh, people were taken out was because they got to be a Christian. Why? Because they resemble the king. Look at their appearance. They resemble the king. Look at their temperament. They resemble the king. Look at their countenance. They resemble the king, and their testimony resembled the king. And so, of course, uh, that is our challenge, and we're supposed to do that. So, how do we do that? Uh, we find out what the Bible says about a Christian appearance and do it. We find out what the Bible says, and I read a lot of them, what, what type of temperament should a Christian have and do it. Uh, we saw, saw several verses about the countenance. And read them and do them. And the testimony. So spend time with God enough that he rubs off. Again, that's why that kid puts the hand on his hip. Why? Because he or she is with his mom or dad all the time. Uh, and they say those words. They do those, those uh, demonstrations. Why? Because it's rubbed off on them. They spend a lot of time with you. Uh, you can't send them away. <laughs> uh, you got to raise them. Uh, but anyway, the same thing here. Spend a lot of time with God. Let that rub off. Uh, and listen to what the Holy Spirit says, that small, still voice. And make a commitment like uh, the one man said, Job, I've made a commitment with these eyes. I'm not going to let anything. I'm setting no wicked thing before me. Now, I got one illustration and we'll be finished. Uh, this was a story I, I, I found. And it's a true story. And uh, not, not that I, everything I've been telling you is not true because that's from the Bible. But this story, it says here, a girl named Tamara. Uh, arrived at her new university. She went to college. And it says her fellow students seemed unusually friendly. You know, because when you get to a new place, everybody's sizing each other up. And they are. They're checking out your duds. Uh, they're checking out your, your, your temperament, things like that. They are sizing you up. But it says here, everybody was unusually friendly. And it caught her off guard. <laughs> you know, it shouldn't be that way, amen. Praise the Lord for our church. Everybody's friendly. Uh, it says here, people said uh, that they had never laid eyes on her. Uh, they would smile at her and wave at her like they were long lost friends. And, a, and, and she was a new student and it caught her off guard of this behavior. A few people said that she looked like someone else that they knew. And Tamara figured it was probably somebody else from Mexico. And so that's where she was born. She was born in Mexico, and now she was at school. So a friend of a friend showed up at her 20th birthday, uh, and it says here, could not stop staring at her. So it started giving her the heebie-jeebies. First of all, everybody was acting like they were long-lost friends. Now here's this dude staring at her. And so, of course, you know, her ray auditor should have went off. She should have smacked him upside the head. But anyway, uh, said he was staring at her. So finally, this stranger named Justin told her that she looked exactly like his friend Andrea. So Tamara and Andrea. And it says here, she was also born in Mexico. So that's not that big a deal. There's lots of people born in Mexico. All right. 
Uh, and so it says here, as they talk, talked farther, uh, some other odd similarities emerged. They both were adopted. Uh, and then, lo and behold, they started talking, and they both had the same birthday. And so it says here, Justin insisted they had to be sisters, or the doppelganger thing that goes on out there. But it says here, Tamara shook her head. She said, no, I was the only child. And uh, so he says, you know, I got to introduce you to her. And so she agreed. It says here, thus uh, began unfolding a real life fairy tale. Andrea raised a Roman Catholic in a house with a picket fence in the valley on Long Island. Tamara was raised in a Jewish family in an apartment around the American Museum of National History in the Upper West Side of Manhattan. And they co it comes to find out that they were actually twins. Okay, uh, why? Because they resembled each other. People that knew both of them said that there's no way. It says here, it came uh, to light a few evenings after the birthday party when Justin uh, arranged Tamara and Andrea an in to instant message each other. And as soon as they discovered uh, that they were both from Mexico, they were both born on the same day, they were both five, three and three quarters inches. <laughs> uh, and then it goes on to talk about that they both used Pantene, Pantene shampoo uh, there was a lot of similarities, uh, even though that they weren't raised in the same house. Uh, and it says here, over and over, uh, minus the small birthmark on Tamara's eyebrow, they were identical twins. Uh, and it was obvious to everybody else, not to them. So we see here similarities. Tim, uh, these twins agreed to meet the following uh, week at the McDonald's. Great place to meet, I guess. And they... they, uh, they, they kind of awkwardly started talking to each other, looking at each other, and, uh, and their, their friends were like, I told you! <laughs> uh, and so anyway, uh, they actually became obviously friends and found out that they were both adopted. Why? Just because similarities. So when somebody sees us, you got a twin sister? <laughs> Probably not, all right? But how about this? Are you a Christian? It should be that obvious. That's what he's saying. These guys were killed because they resembled the king. Got to be a Christian. And so is there enough evidence to convict us being a Christian? Lord Jesus, thank you for this day. And thank you for the opportunity we have to serve you. And Lord, we, we appreciate you putting this story in the Bible. That these people were actually uh, taken out because they resembled the king. And Lord, we know that the Bible says that you're the king of kings. Uh, but, of course, we saw many, many truths tonight that the Bible says that we ought to represent you just like we would represent uh, our company. We ought to represent you just like we would represent our family. Uh, and we ought to resemble you, Lord, in our look and, Lord, our temperament uh, and, Lord, even in our countenance and even in our testimony. Lord, help us to desire to look like you, act like you, behave like you, think like you, uh, respond like you. Lord, I want to resemble you in every way. Let's all stand. Uh, Miss Tiffany's going to play. Altar is open. If you'd like to come pray, ask God to help you to resemble him, resemble the king. Just like anything in this world, uh, I'll say it like this, it's, it's not a competition. It's not who can resemble him the most wins. Uh, it's just an individual thing. I'm supposed to represent and resemble God. You're supposed to represent and resemble God. And it's between you and him. Uh, and so that's where a lot of people, they get into a competition I read more Bible than you. And if you're trying to read more Bible than the next person, you're losing your reward. Just, just don't worry about it. Read Bible. Well, I'm going to look more like God than you look like God. And that makes me a better Christian. It's not a competition. All right? It's all an individual thing with you and God. So just like 
Uh, I told uh, when I preach about salvation, uh, if it's, uh, you got a question about that, you can see me privately. I'm not trying to embarrass anybody. Same thing. Got any questions? I'll help you find it. Uh, and again, I, I've just decided in my life, God, I want to represent you in everything and resemble you in everything. And that, that should be something that we all desire. Uh, and just please him. Again, it's not a competition. Amen. All right. So let's see here. Brother Dave, you dismiss us in prayer.